welcome to today's Power Hour on Vision. Uh, we're really excited today to have Monica Jones, who is the executive director and what is the term? Visionary founder and executive director of the Brain Recovery Project, Childhood Epilepsy Surgery Foundation. Um, she's here with Dr. Linda Lawrence. I'm going to let Monica um, describe Linda and her many, many titles and hats. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Dr. Linda Lawrence is on our scientific advisory board, and I first met her at a cortical vision impairment meeting. I think I had reached out to her on the APOS website first, because one of the challenges we found is that children with a homonymous hemianopia were not being found to have cortical vision impairment, according to the Roman Lansky CBI range. And that uh, Linda is very good at hooking you. And the next thing I knew, I was part of the CBI collab with Linda Lawrence. The op she's the ophthalmologist here. Uh, Christine Lansky, Gordon Dutton, kind of all the big names that she knows in the world of cortical vision impairment. And we uh, partnered with Perkins for several years to really kind of change the landscape of CBI. Um, it really started with us saying, hey, that range does not pick up a lot of the impairments our kids have. Um, and L Linda is still very involved uh, with what we do through, our through the Scientific Advisory Board. Um, she's fantastic and a wealth of information. Um, is there anyone on the call whose child has not had a hemispheric surgery, like TPO or hemispherectomy or something like that. Everyone here has a kid who's had a hemispheric surgery? Yep, okay. Do you all feel like you truly understand homonymous hemianopia? Turn off your mics, everybody. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> kind of, yeah, kind of, no. I find... Yes, um, about 20% at least of parents don't fully understand the extent of the visual impairment. I'm gonna spend about seven minutes going through it. Um, we, we even find that some neurologists don't fully understand it, which really surprises me. So your vision is in two lobes of the brain, uh, primarily processed in the back two lobes of the brain called your occipital lobes. And your field of vision is what you see at any given time that your eyes are looking at something. So if you look at me now, this is my field of vision. But if I turn my eyes to the left, now this is my field of vision. If I look up, now this is my field of vision. If I look down, now this is my field of vision. And we as humans are constantly moving our eyeballs. So your field of vision is always shifting. The right side of the brain in the back sees the left side of your visual field and the left side sees the entire right side. So what happens if you remove one hemisphere or one occipital lobe? You lose your entire field of vision on the opposite side. Here's the normal field of vision and I want you to pay attention to this dot in the middle, this green dot, that's your fovea, your central vision. Linda, would you correct me when I'm wrong? Sure. <laughs> I'm, sure I'm gonna be wrong at some point, of course, because um, I learned all this from you. Your central field is the only spot in your field of vision where you see at 100% acuity. So if you were to stick your thumb out, look at your thumbnail, that's about the size of your entire central field of vision. It's the only place where you see at 100% acuity. So for example, when you're reading, you have to shift your eyeballs to the letters so that they get into your central field of vision so that you can see them at 100% acuity. The middle is detail sharp. On the outside is where we see movements, changes in brightness. But if I wanna see something, I have to put my eyeballs on that thing that I'm trying to look at. Uh, again, motion on the outside, color, we start to see around here, shape around here, but text has to be in your central field of vision. This is a, homon a right homonymous hemianopia after left hemispherectomy. Here's your central field of vision. So kids not only lose the entire right or the entire left, they also lose half of their central field of vision. So when we're talking about learning how to read, 
You're asking a child who can only see half a word at any given time to learn how to read. This is why our programs focus so much on trying to help the school understand the extent of the vision impairment, because when you can only see half a word in, or half a page or half a sentence, learning how to read can be really difficult. Well, I think about it as like having contact lenses on or half is blocked out. And that would really help you appreciate the extent of the visual field loss. I'll stop here. There's a question, Monica. Uh huh. Does neural plasticity apply to vision as well? Like you, how you can learn to walk after hemi surgery? No. So once you've lost, at least as far as we know, not only based upon what the research says, but also if you look at Marlene Berman's presentation from our 2019 conference, and she is a neuroscientist who focuses primarily on how the brain reorganizes after uh, surgeries to remove part of the occipital lobe or in its entirety. The field of vision can never be recovered, but other aspects like visual processing can be recovered. And in fact, in the kids she studied extensively, most of them had sort of normal visual processing, identifying objects, identifying words, understanding the speed at which something is moving, just like you and I do. However, they had still lost their entire visual field. Do you want to pop in now? Linda? Linda? Oh, sure, sure. Um, let me see. Can Let me, I think what I'll, I, if it's okay, what I'll start out, I prepared a, a PowerPoint based on some of the questions and um, then we can just open it up for more questions. Also, if you want to stop me in the middle, I have it kind of sequenced off. And um, there's just so much information that, is, is out there and that you all would benefit from. And I, I hope what I can maybe do is, is also help you with some terminology so you know the questions to ask. You know, when you go to your doctor or when you're talking with your teachers that you get the right lingo to, to ask the questions instead of just like, well, how's my child doing? You know, if you can say, okay, what's the positioning? What about lighting? What, you know, the more specific questions. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm really not going to go into a lot of medical detail about this, but let me, let me see if I can figure out how to get this up here. I hope that works. Yes. And I'd like to show you a little new stuff that we're doing out here in Kansas too. So let's see, this should start. Okay. Oh, I got started in the middle. So Linda, I'm going to reclaim host so I can let Thank any you. late attendees and you should okay. still be able to um, show your screen, but if there's a problem, just let me know. So, you know, if we're talking and I follow, um, you know, I'm in the middle of Kansas, so I'm not part of a big medical center, but I do get a lot of referrals from the area of kids who've had a variety of, of um, uh, types of brain surgeries or brain injuries that maybe aren't surgical. So. Um, the way we practice, and I work very, very closely with my teachers at the visually impaired and with school teams. In fact, like Thursday, I'll have seven kids in my office with their teacher of the visually impaired and any of their teachers who can attend or any who can attend by Zoom, which now has been wonderful because we can Zoom in the classroom teacher or Zoom in the OT or Zoom in the PT, whoever's working with that child, we can just have them on the Zoom. And so the testing that I'm doing to demonstrate, you know, the uniqueness of each child, they can see and they can ask the questions. So I think a couple of things I wanna emphasize is your child is gonna be different than any other child. Um, the reason for the seizures are going to be different. The surgery is going to be different. The medications are going to be different. And so all of those add into making each child so unique that we can't ever say always or never. 
So even to the neuroplasticity, sometimes we see recover and we're like puzzled, but it's like, oh yeah, they had a seizure disorder before the surgery. And some of that could have been due to other types of brain injury that could recover. So, you know, there's so the, your kids are so complex that anybody who says it's easy doesn't know what they're talking about. <laughs> I don't think it's easy at all. So what we have to remember in the small child, especially, uh, you know, a birth to three child, which, which I have some, some little ones who've had um, the, the epilepsy surgery and, you know, over, overall childhood development is the most important thing at that stage. You know, the child needs all of their senses to develop to the best of their capabilities. So, um, um, you know, little, little guys, tend to adapt really fastly and they can fake you out a little bit because they can they can get through so many things that you can actually even miss that there's visual field loss and believe me i've done it i'm like wow this is amazing and what they've done is they've just adapted so well with a head turn or an eye gaze or something that you think oh oh it's 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 okay and they can and that's what we want to try and figure out where the deficits might be so that we can teach compensatory um, strategies to deal with this, right? If we, you know, we're all about fix what we can fix, what we can't fix, we rehab and, and work around it so that the child has the best outcome. So diagnosis is always helpful and important for me as the ophthalmologist, I wanna know were the seizures from a genetic disorder? Were they from a intrauterine stroke? Were they, we have not a clue. Um, you know, was it from tumor? You know, these are all important things for me to know so I can better understand that child. We need, of course, a comprehensive eye exam um, with acuities and we can measure acuity at 32 weeks of gestation in the NICU. So if anybody says too young to test, not cooperative for, for acuity or visual field tests, they really haven't taken the time to look at that child. I mean, sometimes, you know, we all have meltdowns. And so, yeah, sometimes the child's not going to be cooperative. But in a play situation or later on follow up with someone like the, the um, teacher, the visually impaired, you know, we can measure the visual fields. Unfortunately, in the young child, we don't have a good standardized measurement of visual fields. We do confrontation, but confrontation can sometimes overestimate the field because if there's a neglect or if you do movement, then sometimes in the blind field, movement can be um, perceived by another unusual area of the brain called the thalamus, and it can fake you out again. You think, oh, well, they're seeing over there. They saw the movement. No, they just perceived the movement, but they didn't really see it. You know, can you, ex can you explain confrontation assessment real quick? To the, yeah, to so the group? confrontation, what we would do is the child sitting up front and we would go in, technically you should do one eye at a time, right? Because each eye um, the, the nerves from each eye split in the area of the pituitary gland, part goes straight back, part cross. And so you have innervation of vision from both sides of the brain and reception of vision. So um, um, you wanna check each eye. So you would start out in the far periphery, remembering that your, your side field goes out roughly 90 degrees, okay? So if you put your hand straight out and, well, mine isn't quite that, mine's about 80 degrees maybe. So you can see your fingers out there wiggling or we would use an object like a, a pen. Um, often we'll use a red cap object because we think those are better, better perceived. So then we would start out here and bring the fingers in until the child would turn their head or the patient would say, I see it. Um, and we would go in the lower lower part of the field of vision, like down below, we would have the, the child looking straight ahead. We would go up above and doing one eye at a time or counting fingers is another way, again, depending on age and ability of the child. Um, there's other ways to do it. There's a little wand that Dr. Leia invented that we sometimes use and it has a little light flicker and we can bring it in from the sides, but typically your doctor is gonna check the side vision and is not gonna cover one eye and check nasally. And that's where, again, we can miss the, 
the homonymous hemianopia because it's in both eyes. We'll often get somebody who says, oh, well, they've had the surgery and now they can't see out of the left eye. It's not the left eye, it's the left side of each eye. And the importance of that is, especially later on with reading, you can have kind of blind spots in your field of vision. Now, in your visual field, if you shut one eye and you look straight ahead, you can see, you can see straight ahead, you can see about 80 to 90 degrees out here. And over here, you can see about 40 to 60 degrees. Okay, that's the clincher. Your visual field in, in each eye doesn't stop straight ahead. It goes out. And you know what? It's blocked by the nose. Otherwise, you could see like this, like a, you know, 90 degrees. Why, why, do, why can't you see 90 degrees over that way? Your nose blocks it, okay? So you're only gonna see about 40 degrees, but you know what? If you, if you shut one eye and you say, oh, my nose is blocking my field, I can see there. What if you turn your body? Guess what? You can see all the way over there. So body turn, eye turn, and face turns are ways that we compensate for loss of visual field or visual field neglect. And so that's again back to, does the child have an actual occipital lobe? That part of the brain, that visual field is gone. Is that the problem? Or do they have a higher functioning in the other lobes of the brain, parietal and or temporal lobe that is gonna be a neglect? So the occipital lobe, you know, the brain's seeing that, but those fields are just not processing it. They're like, eh, I, don't, I don't really care about that. I'm, I'm doing something else. Thank you very much. And so you neglect it. So, um, and I have a picture of this later on, but if you have a visual field loss, moving your head or eye can help you compensate for it. Um, I have one adult and I love it when he comes in. <laughs> He's so kind. He had a stroke a brain uh, uh, occipital lobe stroke when he was a young man from a heart arrhythmia. He's fine. He's a realtor. He's a dad. He's a grandpa. You know, he has just really done well. Drives a car, um, which scares everybody to death, but he drives a car and uh, works as a realtor. I mean, he does. And so when he comes in, every time he comes in, I said, okay, tell me your compensatory <laughs> mechanisms for this because he has half of his field and each side, it is gone. And so, you know, and I can see his slight face turn and he doesn't know he's doing it, but a slight face turn, um, a slight head turn. And, you know, he has developed compensatory things to help him and he passed a realtor's license, you know. So, you know, it, it, because you have this doesn't mean you're not gonna be able to do these higher functioning things. That what I always go back to is what causes seizures in the first place, because some of those conditions could limit what the child might be able to do in the future, you know, if it's genetic or how extensive or, or whatever. But anyway, in the young child, again, the developmental assessments are, are so important. You know, um, they're walking their cognitive, social, emotional skill. All of those things are, are so important. And so it's not just about the eyeballs or the visual fields or this. You have to look at that whole little package of a person. And, and that's kind of my philosophy. And that's what I really carry through into elementary school and adulthood. Um, and then in school age, you know, literacy becomes important. Are they going to be able to read? Are they going to be able to do math? Is there a head turn? Make it so people are going to say, well, they never look at me. How come they're not looking at me? And is that going to interfere with social and peer interactions? And then how does that field loss interfere with leisure activities, you know, playing ball, um, you know, they never get picked for the team because they, you know, they miss the ball on that side. So, you know, these are things that, that you, you, sometimes you forget about, but it's about being the whole, the whole person. And then in vocational time, it's, it's job issues and driving. Driving is going to be a big one as the kids get older. So just things to think about. And no one can tell you if your three-year-old is going to be able to drive a car when they're 16, you know, or not, yes or no. So, you know, it's, it's to ask your doctor, do, do you think they'll be able to drive? Your doctor's going to say yes or no, and they could be wrong. <laughs> so just know that there's not a crystal ball and driving is one of those issues that really has to be explored, 
with each individual person based on their compensatory mechanisms, their reflex time, any other challenges, you know, are there hearing challenges too? You know, these are the things that can interfere and there are driving schools and driving assessments that can be done. And then as far as services, I know there's always questions about IEPs and, you know, the doctors are really the worst people to ask about IEPs because if you go into a room of especially ophthalmologists and you say, oh, um, do you know what the IFSP said? Or do you know, have you written something for the IFSP or the IEP or the 504? And they'll, you know, half of them will go, uh, what's that? So um, your doctor may need some education about um, IEPs. Um, pediatric ophthalmologists tend to be a little more knowledgeable about this, but even sometimes, you know, the lingo changes and maybe they haven't done paperwork for this or they have a standard exam. You know, our standard electronic health record now is about 10 pages, half of it's worthless for the teacher or the parent to look at, like, do they smoke? on everything. Do they drink alcohol? Every three-year-old has a no, no alcohol, no smoking. They have this, you know, a whole list of systemic review systems, and then they don't have a refraction on the eye exam. So the, some of these medical records now, the electronic health records really don't have the right information for the school. Okay. So you may need to bring in another form. I have another form. And you, what the doctor has to say is that they believe the visual impairment interferes with access to education. And Monica, can, she's way better at the words with IP. I usually ask my parents, what do you need from me um, and, and my kids? And I can advocate for them or I can you know, write a letter or do something. But you have to remember that ophthalmologists and physicians can diagnose and they can write a report, but they cannot order educational interventions. So I cannot call the school and say, I want that child to have orientation mobility. I want that child to have um, a TBI. Now I have a pretty good relationship in, in my area and in my state. So they trust me. So if I say, I'll call the school for the blind. And I can say, can you put this kid on your radar? I think they, they're having an issue. Um, just need the TBI to go in, do a functional assessment, talk with the classroom teacher, see what the needs are. But for me to say, oh no, they need Braille. Oh no, they need O and M. Oh no, you know, they, they don't really like that because that is really not my field. And, and that's their decision and the educational team's decision. And I, I know a lot of times I have patients who, who really they keep saying, I want you to write a detailed letter to the school about what my child needs. And I'm like, <laughs> I, you know, the, I rely the on the school my, will throw it away. They throw it away. Yeah, the lawyers yeah. will laugh. Yeah. So yeah. just just to the doctors there to help you, but the doctor, if you can have them say, you know, um, my child has a, you know this hemianopia, and I really need you to document that 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 is um, a problem in the brain and that it is CVI or cerebral visual impairment. Um, back to what Monica said about our discussion. Um, we, we had this discussion because it's like they were having kids and heck their visual acuity is fine. They're functioning fine. I'm like, you know, they took part of their brain away. You cannot deny that child services. That's just nuts. And Dr. Dutton luckily agreed with me and we kind of walked through this, what we were going to do. And on his website, if you want further information, CVI Scotland, it's great. There's a huge section on homonymous hemianopia. And, and that it is CVI. And I, I definitely call it CVI. The importance of that, at least in my state, is if a child has a diagnosis of CVI, they get services. So um, I, I think, you know, every state's different, every community's different, but my, my teachers beg for that diagnosis because they want to serve kids. You know, they don't want to deny kids. They want to serve kids but they can't serve kids without the proper diagnosis. So really pushing for that CVI diagnosis is important. And not all ophthalmologists may do that. And maybe the ophthalmologists need an education. We 
We've been having more and more seminars on CVI and low vision, which is really good in our, in our um, ophthalmology um, association. So, and Monica would be better also to explain IEP versus 504 plans, but I have to say the 504 plan, which guarantees a safe environment and access to education also, some of our small rural schools where the child should have an IEP, they don't get it, they get a 504. But in the 504, they are getting all the services they would in an IEP without the paperwork is what they tell me. Um, so sometimes they prefer the 504, even though legally, Monica, I see your eyes going back, ah! but you know, it's like, hey, pick our battles. I'm not gonna go to battle with a small school district that is bending over. They already have their TVI, o &M. They have, you know, special classes and they just have a 504. Well, they're, they're getting what they need in that situation. So, um, you know, we, we keep monitoring it and, you know, it's just every place is different. And, you know, the other thing, like in the rural areas, like I'm in, um, there are some schools that have never had a child with a visual impairment, period. So they don't know even where to start. Um, so, you know, we just try and really work with our teachers in our school districts. Um, um, and again, back to the seizures and the visual function, we have to we have to go back and think about what caused the seizures to begin with. Was it something that already damaged the visual centers before the surgery? Is there some, back to the question about neuroplasticity, maybe there's some recovery in some of those areas because of the damage that was done by another, not the surgery, but something else. Um, and we also have to realize that some medications really affect um, vision and vocabulary can cause blindness, but it's, sometimes it's the only thing we have. Some of the other um, medications, oh, what's the one for um, the um, salivation? I'm blocking on it right now, but that's an anticholinergic drug and that can cause some difficulty with focusing ability. So and a lot of the medications can cause, you know, there's a variety of things. That's a whole nother talk. So, um, but you got to remember there are other factors. There's cognitive factors too on is the child able to use their vision cognitively, again, depending on what the underlying problem is um, to begin with. And so the, the hemispherectomy again, and then it's what kind of, of procedure was done. So each procedure can have a little bit different effect on the visual system. So that, and this is also complex. That's why I say each child, we have to really look at them in detail with our assessments and, and look at them as a, as a whole person. If it's just, um, this is just a picture that shows different kinds of visual field losses. You know, you can have um, homonymous hemianopias, you can have quadrantinopias where it's just a quadrant, you can have inferior field loss. You, so there's some different, you can have macular sparing depending on the lesion and the occipital lobe. So the, the maculas are spared. So there's all this variety. If you just look at that table, it's like a little overwhelming and it tells what location and this is something medical students have to, have to memorize. But uh, back to if you think this is a diagram that made me remind myself to tell you, the eyeballs are the receptor of the information. The eyeballs are like your cell phone, okay? So you're gonna take the picture with your cell phone, right? And you know what? Your cell phone has to have a good camera. So the eyeballs have to be good. You have to have the proper prescription. You have to have, you know, no other problems in the eye, right? Um, so you, you take the picture and then the picture comes down, it, it crosses here across in the retina, and then it crosses here again, right in front of the pituitary, this is right in front of the pituitary in the middle of the brain, and then half goes to one side, half goes to the other side, half goes straight back to the occipital lobes in the back. So basically the first image is in the back of the brain in the occipital lobes, okay? So you see in your brain, now that's not intuitive to most people, even doctors, even really smart people, they don't intuitively think, you think, oh, well, I see my eyeballs. So it's an eyeball problem. I can exercise my eyeballs. I can do, no, you see in the brain. So everything about utilizing vision when you have 
low vision or poor vision based on brain based reasons. It's about the brain and brain and how you use your brain and how the whole person uses their brain, not just about eye exercises or, or these kind of things. So anyway, okay. Sorry, can I interrupt? I just, there's several questions in the chat. Is this, do you want to, are you sure, sure. finish this slide and then maybe we'll jump in for some questions? Sure. sure. Do you have more on this slide or? Well, this was just to show how compensatory strategies are. Like this is a child whose eye is turning out a little mm -hmm. bit. And let me just show you this last one. And then yeah. this child has a little bit of a face turn so that they, they can bring their seeing field into where they're wanting to look and oh no this one didn't show yeah okay and this is the one i really wanted to show you about placement because we have visual visual neglect um this is the top three are the hemianopia so this is the the seeing area here with the shade being the non-seeing area this is looking straight ahead this is with a head turn and you can see how much more this expanded. And this is with a body turn that didn't really make much difference versus neglect, which is past the occipital lobe where here's straight ahead, they look similar. Here's with a head turn, not much improvement with the neglect, but look with the body turn, how much more visual field is apparent by moving the body so it's kind of interesting to think like in the classroom, I know there was one question about, well, where should my child be placed in the classroom? And I think not only is it placement, but it may be how they can move their body and they should be allowed to, to do this. So, okay, we can, we can stop for a second and. Okay, I'm gonna go down the list of questions. I answered some of them in the chat. So don't look, cause then you can tell me if I was wrong. <laughs> So the first question is, um, does a child with homonymous hemianopia have a CVI? And yeah. so you were addressing this and I know, um, you know, you, Monica and I have thought and talked a lot about this. Can you explain, um, or, or one of us can talk about how it's relevant in the school setting? Because I think there's a lot of confusion among the teachers in the school, yeah. understanding how hemianopia is a CVI. Yeah, so, so basically the definition of CVI is a visual impairment that is not explained by the ocular condition. In other words, if you had a cataract um, and you had CVI, you would have to weed out, okay, is the problem with the vision more from the cataract or is it CVI? You know, you could have two things and that's where it gets confusing is you can have an ocular condition and CVI, so CVI, the terminology is really bad out there and it's very confusing. So there's cortical visual impairment, which initially refer to the damage in the occipital lobes alone. And then it kind of, and in, in we started calling it cerebral visual impairment because really it's it, there's more of the parts of the brains, not just the occipital lobes, but the temporal and parietal lobes. And now we like to go to brain base because Brain base involves the thalamus too, which is another thing important in vision. So, so if we talk about brain-based visual impairment, which we use, this is how I explain it to myself. Brain, I believe it should be called brain-based visual impairment or neurological visual impairment. Yeah. Rather we than tried or cerebral because that means, oh, it's just this part of the brain or this part. So if indeed CVI is a kind of a um, label, which is kind of, I mean, when we're talking in our meetings anymore in papers, it's like, okay, some people call it cortical, some people call it cerebral. We're going to call it, we're just going to say CVI. And so you know that we're not fighting about the term, but it's a brain based visual impairment. Um, so, therefore, loss of part of your visual field in both eyes is a brain based visual impairment. Yeah. So what, where I think the confusion comes, Monica, I would love you to address this, is that TVIs don't, haven't had any of this. Like what training does a TVI, a teacher of the visually impaired, have in any sort of brain-based visual impairment? Monica? So here, here's the challenge. And this is where things got um, hot a little bit in the past few years when we've been working as part of the CVI collab with Perkins. Most 
TBIs in the country use the Christine Roman Lansky um, CBI assessment. range. Mm -hmm. And if your child scores high on the CBI range, they magically don't have a CBI. That's what the TBIs conclude. The range is not valid or reliable. It has not been determined to be valid or reliable. And it's never been determined valid or reliable for children with a homonymous hemianopia, period. End of discussion. My son scores extremely high on the CBI range because he's been able to adapt to his visual field loss. He turns his body, he can navigate pretty well, but he's missing the entire left hemisphere of his brain. We have published a paper with the UCLA neuro-ophthalmology team that has a sentence in it that says, homonymous hemianopia is a cortical, is a cerebral vision impairment so that you don't have that confusion with your teams. But yes, it's a CBI and you have to make sure that the school team understands that it's a CBI and that's gonna be challenging if they're using the CBI range. So you have to push back against that range being used. Yeah, it's such a unique condition. I think it's just really hard for school teams to understand. And um, another question is- um, oh, Let me add something really quick to that. Sure. Um, the currently the training manual for TBIs, which is the foundations of low vision is being rewritten. And I happen to be working with two other people rewriting that and we'll be adding a chapter on CVI and we already have this included. <laughs> okay, great. So, <laughs> so hopefully it will change. <laughs> Does a hemianopia CVI qualify for any additional benefits like social security? No. Uh, Yes. She says, yes. no, I say yes. This is our relationship, by the way. Yeah. We're like an yes. old married couple. No. Well, <laughs> here's the challenge. Yes, but not automatically. You have to get your child assessed. And if you don't have that diagnosis, then this is a good question, Audrey. Oh, so I just went through if this. You, with, yeah. But, but, right. but Bennett can take the test mm -hmm. that the Social Security Administration would give him. My son cannot. Yeah. He cannot talk. He, he's yeah. got severe intellectual impairment. But it's more than that. So not only does the child need to be able to pass the test, you have to go to an assessor that understands what social security is looking for, because it's not the same test that a regular ophthalmologist would do. Um, mm -hmm. There's a specific formula and it has to do with visual efficiency because actually the field loss alone is not sufficient to qualify for social security. The way they did it for my son, we went to the UC Berkeley low vision clinic and they did kind of looked at everything. So like visual because he has a nystagmus he's got esophoria he's got other conditions and kind of came up with a formula they didn't make anything up they were basing it on social security's very specific requirements but they provided a letter saying that um he qualifies you know he's eligible now whether or not we'll get it i don't know yet because we're in that process right now and you're right monica for a child who is non-verbal or non-testable it would probably be impossible and again, you'd need an evaluator who really knows what assessment would be needed for social security. Yeah. Yeah. That's something we're talking about doing a webinar on. Um, yeah. And the social security attorneys I talk to always say to me, don't let social security assess the child. So you want to go to them with an assessment and say, no, our assessment is good. You're not doing an assessment because they're not going to think about how complicated this is already. Right. And then you're going to throw, you know, a retired optometrist at this problem, it's not going to, which is, you know, kind of what they would do. So the, the problem with homonymous hemianopia and really any CBI is it's an invisible disability. Mm -hmm. And you see it, if you come to the conferences, wow, some of the kids, they're doing so great. They're walking around, they're, they're managing their environment. Nobody would ever guess that they're half blind. Mm -hmm. And now when you start to put this into the legal scheme, it gets even more difficult for sure. Yeah. They don't look blind, most of them, but they are lost half their visual field. Yeah. A question just popped up that's related to this. Does 
does the CVI diagnosis, if the child is already diagnosed with hemino hem homonymous hemianopia and receives school-based vision and orientation mobility services, is there any additional benefit to having a CVI diagnosis on, with that? Um, yes, because, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, yeah, I, I think, yeah. I you know at least from my, T, my TVIs that they, they ask, they, they feel like they can do more with the child if they have that diagnosis um, than just homonymous hemianopia. They, they really, it, my TVIs want that CVI diagnosis. And I'll show you some of the ways we do that together a little bit later, but it, it's at least in Kansas, it seems to really open up the ability for the, for the teachers to, to do more, um, serve the child more. My only concern with that is when you say CVI in some circles, they automatically go to all the Roman training, which includes things like bubbling the letters on text, um, which we don't know if that helps children learn how to read. Um, for my son, it's confusing when all of a sudden a word has all this coloring around it. So be careful what can sometimes be a sword on your side. Be careful how you're using it because if the CBI, if the TBI automatically assumes, oh, this child has CBI, therefore everything has to be in black and white or with a yellow background and we have to bubble all the letters, that's probably not going to work out. Make sure you understand what interventions are being used when you put that, that designation on them. I think the question about Braille was answered, but since we're on this reading slide, um, if you have, if anyone has other Braille related questions, just unmute and ask it right now. And then um, I'll let you do your slide, but I'm just gonna make this one comment um, or question, which is like, what are the, when it comes to school services, what kinds of things should we be asking for in terms of vision? And so why don't maybe Linda do talk about this slide and maybe we could answer that question um, as well. Yeah, and again, every child is so different and, and what their abilities are going to be and, and how they should be taught. And, and I don't think a child, you can, you can just say, oh, we always do this or we never do this. I think you, you really, you know, your teachers need to really be continuously assessing um, what they're doing and how they're teaching. And, um, you know, the, the Braille question is, is really an educational question that should be answered by a trained, um, a trained TBI who's doing the proper assessment. They can do, at least we do here, what's called a learning media assessment where um, the teacher um, usually with, we have some, uh, we have low vision optometrists in our state who do this with the teacher in most cases where um, they look at, okay, is this child gonna learn better visually, um, just using their vision and adapting? Are they gonna need magnification? Um, are they gonna need tactile um, or auditory or a combination of all of it? Um, so those questions need to be answered by very careful assessment. We can't assume that all children with homonymous, homonymous hemianopia or are going to need um, you know, some kind of technical assistant, but we can't assume they're not either. We have to really so carefully look at each child. And again, going back to what was the etiology of the seizure disorder and how did that affect their, the way they're gonna learn also, or those higher pathways of visual perception, you know, is there other kinds of, of um, uh, problems in the brain, either from the original seizure disorder or the surgery that is, that's affecting not just the visual field, but the actual processing of the information. So, you know, all, all of that needs to be thought of. Braille more typically, this is, this is the way I think of Braille, is certainly if it was something progressive, if we like um, for example, we have a child right now with a midline brain tumor, and I'm, I'm going to hope they teach her Braille because we don't know right now she can read with low vision devices, but she's still in the treatment phase. And we don't know 
if she's going to end up losing her vision. So that would be a case you could say, well, let's start doing the tactile training for Braille because this is potentially a progressive disorder. The other thing is if the vision's poor enough, maybe the child's not only have has had surgery for the epilepsy, but has had um, another kind of brain injury that's led to poor acuity. So they're not gonna be able to use the, the residual field because something else has damaged the ability to, to see. So wow. that's why I, I hope that's not too confusing, but every child is a whole complex package of neurological, developmental, cognitive, um, environmental factors that, that really need continuous assessment. And, you know, I hope that also you, you can fight for not just having one assessment a year <laughs> from mm -hmm. a TBI, you know, I mean, some kids, maybe that's all they need and they're getting the services and they're doing fine. But most kids, especially younger kids are gonna be really changing exponentially and need continuous assessment and, and changing an intervention, you know. Um, um, back to the Roman Lansky scale, you know, we find um, in our babies, um, in our in early intervention, that that scale can actually kind of help us get, get a head start, you know, on, on, oh yeah, okay, so they're having trouble here and here and, and help us with interventions. But in the older children, you know, it's, it, it doesn't. And, and we have a whole slew of other, you know, assessments that lead to interventions. Um, and that those are all published and those are all out there. And um, I think as this book training for TVIs is being rewritten, those are all going to be included too. So that'll be part of what, what they're, they're, they're learning more about the, the variety of assessments that are out there because you have to have a lot of tools in the toolbox you know, there's not one way that's all good or all bad. There's a variety of things in the TVIs. And, you know, they have a lot to learn and, and they're trying to learn and they're, they're, they're learning more and more and they have meetings about this and, and just like the, the doctors do, but nobody has all of the answers uh, on the exact way to do this. Monica has her hand raised. Yeah, I did want to, this is kind of some bad news, but at Sean Handley's team out of Great Ormond Street in England uh, published a paper a few, maybe two years ago, and he is assessing adults who had hemispherectomy in childhood and looking at their vision. And what they're starting to see is that over time, many lose acuity in the eye opposite the removed hemisphere, and the visual field also gets smaller. And it appears to be something that's irreversible. So as your child is getting older, make sure that they're followed to see if they're starting to lose acuity in that opposite eye. The other thing is for those of you whose children have hydrocephalus after a hemispheric procedure, that can also, oh, there you go. You were gonna um, talk about it here. Okay. That can also, ah, you're gonna never, I'll stop. <laughs> Go ahead. You were going to talk about this. Go ahead. Oh, gee, no, I just put that up because I thought that reinforces. Yeah. So my son, because of high pressure, has so much optic nerve damage to one side that his neuro ophthalmologist uh, says he probably sees very little, if anything, from that eye opposite the removed hemisphere. The other thing that can cause that visual, that vision loss in that eye is if your child has a strabismus, a wandering eye, if over time the brain can shut it out. So that's another thing we see is what's called amblyopia in that eye opposite the removed hemisphere. So a lot of different moving parts here when we're talking about vision. And there are many kids in our community that have a complete amblyopia of that opposite eye. They cannot see any more out of that eye. And, and without a, you know, you look in and the eye looks normal. So it's like, what, what's going on here? Yeah. 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 Someone, um, not to go backwards, but had a question about the slide on visual neglect. So we may need to go back to that if we can. And then just so you know what some of the other questions are coming up, we have a question about um, vision therapy. And then also um, what happens if the teacher 
says the child doesn't need services because he's not impacted educationally, which in my opinion is generally the lack of understanding about this condition from the school team. It sounds like mm -hmm. Linda, you work with an amazing group of TBIs, but um, what I'm seeing for the most part is school teams where the teacher, the visually impaired, doesn't understand homonymous hemianopia or nystagmus or any esophoria, any of these other things, nor do they have anything they can offer in terms of accommodations or instructional methods. And therefore they, they deny the child services because they feel that they can't do anything. So they're not gonna, they're not letting, they're not accepting the, giving the child eligibility. So anyway, continue here, but um, we have about nine minutes left. I just wanna make sure we get to some of these questions. Yeah, as well. and I, let me go. Let me just talk about the, the loss of vision in the eye. This is, this is a new, um, there's some new things I just wanted to show you really quick. Now, if the child can sit up to the, what's called the OCT machine, which is a, a way we actually can image the retinal ganglion cells. Um, and this is a child who had a midline brain tumor. And you can see where that yellow is there, that's normal. And where the blue is, those nerve ganglion cells have died because when he had his brain surgery for the tumor, um, that part is just gone, it's missing. And here's his visual field defect, which is a bi, um, bitemporal hemianopia. So it's on the outside of both eyes. And this boy compensated so well that we never even knew he had a problem. And we were able to pick it up on this skin, which led us to the visual field. And this black spot, this, this is a, a line going down here, which is the middle of the field of vision and where this black is, it's just gone. And it is just gone, but with a head turn and everything, he was able to compensate, but the importance is that we can pick this up on OCT scanning. So if the child cannot cooperate for a visual field, which takes about, that takes five to seven minutes an eye, and it's, you have to punch a button and follow a light, and it's, it's hard. It's hard for an adult versus this, which takes seven seconds. If the child can look, follow some simple instructions for seven seconds, you can get a picture of the nerve and the nerve ganglion cells that may help you better in, in assessing the child. Here's a picture of the machine down here with this woman. And that's why I'm saying it's not always easy for a child. Some, you know, we try it on every single child cause I'm in private practice, I can do that. But we, you know, we don't always have success. And the other thing we're doing is called eye gaze. Um, and this is, um, we're hoping to present some material on this with Karina Bauer soon, because they're kind of the, the really important people in doing this. But what we do is we have a screen, a tablet, we hook up an eye gaze to the bottom of it, and the child sits in, in, and plays a video game with their eyes. So we've done it as young as four. Um, I have two kids who've had hemispherectomies who we have results on. Um, this is one of them. And what the machine does is it measures where the eye gaze is. And, you know, basically the, um, it, it's going all over the machine. Like, you know, you can play a guitar, you can play this. There's funny games where you slap a pie in the face or each one of these images would do something funny. And again, it has to be age and ability specific. And then it, it gives us a heat map. And if you can see this heat map, almost half of this side of the tablet is not there. And when we started doing this kind of as a idea from Lofty Maribet, he, you know, we said, oh, you can get this eye tracking. We thought, what, what if that would help us with our assessment of the patient? Now, this doesn't tell us if it's neglect or if it's a visual field loss. We don't, we haven't gotten that sophisticated yet, but we're bringing kids back for a second time now. And we're going to try body turns and eye turns. But what this tells us and what we, the information we give to the classroom teachers, that child's not seeing on the right side. <laughs> so you got to figure out whether you, you let him turn his head, you let him turn his head or turn his body to compensate. And the child pretty soon is going to be able to tell you what works best. I mean, I always ask the child, what, you know, if, if they're able to tell me, you know, where is it the best? So is this a study or is this something that someone could walk into their pediatric ophthalmologist? No, and get this? 
there's probably um, uh, Mark, they're doing it in, in LA, Mark Borscher, and Melinda Chang's doing it, and I'm doing it. It's just a study right now. So what it's about something? Study. We're, it's not even a study. Wow. We're just doing it. What about something like the Readalyzer, which I know is available in many states where they have the tracking device on the eyeball? I, and they, yeah, the child reads a passage because I've seen that done and it's shown very interesting results on our kids. A number and, of post hemispherectomy kids have had uh, it kind of it measures more their visual efficiency, not the field, because we already these are kids with confirmed visual field loss. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and and I think that's important. And again, each child needs to be looked at separately mm -hmm. and differently. And, and let me just make a quick comment about vision therapy. First mm -hmm. of all, Vision therapy, the definition as used in North America, okay, that's North America, that's not Europe, that's not India, because for them, vision therapy is like occupational therapy, physical therapy, vision therapy means they have an educational system around their vision. So they're mm -hmm. different in the rest of the world. Um, vision therapy here is a is a technique that's used by some optometrists, not all, but some optometrists to help improve vision efficiency. There is, is, it's not supported by insurance because it's not felt to be evidence-based. Now that's the, that's what's out there. That's why insurance doesn't cover it. It's not saying that there aren't some good things that happen in vision therapy. The thing I usually find is that for my, my kids, it's so expensive. It's up to $900 a month out of pocket that I would rather see them get a tutor or get an in, some kind of intervention that, that takes a whole child in, into, you know. I have seen medical insurance cover it, not vision. And I've seen school districts cover it on rare occasions. Yeah. So there's so, some, there may be some, it, it, again, very specific. And this is, somebody asked about this synoptic light therapy that I had never heard of. Mm -hmm. There are some reports that doing a light in the hemi field um, may promote motion awareness, but not acuity. Not You're not going to see in that field, but maybe you'd have more awareness of motion. And that's probably from blind sight, which is a whole nother topic. Mm -hmm. There is only yeah. one article in the literature. This is it. And it basically says that these treatments are supported by only a few research studies that lack consensus on the efficacy of this approach. So mm -hmm. there's no evidence for this. Um, so don't spend your money on it. If they're willing to put you in a study or do it and you want to spend the time on, on something like that, mm -hmm. that's, that's something you can do, but the, the literature is just not out there. So, uh, but, but it doesn't mean, you know, it's like our eye gaze system. We don't have an actual study. I'm hoping I've given this information that what, what we're doing to a lot of people who are in big academic centers, hoping they will do the studies. <laughs> but right now we're just using it practically as part of our assessment to just give us information on this child. Again, trying to answer the question, how does this child see and use their vision? That's all I have. Uh, when some, one parent commented that um, they have done vision therapy through the OT because the OT was trained by the optometrist and then it was covered under OT through insurance, which I find interesting. Um, and then uh, someone asked if the funding is there, would you do vision therapy? Is it worth the time to learn compensation techniques? Well, we do compensation techniques. We so meaning who? Our whole team. But, you know, teachers of the vision impaired are not vision therapists. They are vision interventionists. I know. So the parents asking, because at school, they're going to get a vision teacher who's not going to do anything. They're not going to offer anything for the child. That's what I see in the school setting. So is it worth it for the parent to go to a vision therapist and get some of the, the like the compens compensatory techniques that they're not going to get anywhere else? I would say it depend on the vision therapist and what mm. their knowledge is, because yeah. I wouldn't think... Um, and, and I have to say, I think our teachers, and maybe I'm just spoiled by my state because I have educated my teachers and they are, they are, they are good at what they do. And, uh, you know, the thing is that they don't know everything. And, and uh, um, I, I think you just have to um, know what outcome you're expecting. Yeah. And, and know that nobody has the answers and that there's a need for continuous assessment and there's going to be some disagreements because the field is not mm -hmm. going to 
it's not uniform. Yeah. I would say for the best information, I would go to CDI Scotland and look at what's happening in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some new new um, books out. There's one that just came out from the Greater Ormond Group that's awesome on low vision. Um, CDI Scotland has an extensive um, uh, section on homonymous hemianopia. You can read with all sorts of advice. I see that on the prism glasses. Um, I, I've tried them. <laughs> I have to say, you know, because I thought, oh, if that would only work, it really, uh, it really doesn't seem to do much more than the child just adopting a slight face turn or head turn. So, but I'd love to hear if anybody has really good um, uh, results with prism glasses. We, we tried them. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. again, you know, yeah. there's the evidence, unfortunately, there is some, you know, anecdotal stuff in the optometric um, literature. Um, there's not in the ophthalmological, mm -hmm. but I say, you know, if it works, just don't put all your eggs in one basket and think, oh, this is the answer. You yeah. Know? yeah. If it yeah. helps, great, continue it. If it doesn't, don't keep beating your head against the wall yeah. with something that's not working. If you, yeah. if you ever get a chance to see prism glasses or ask the doctor to show you what it would look like, all it does is take the, so that remember the child's visually impaired on the left side, this is my son. It's taking that visual like in the lens and shifting it over a little bit. So it's giving like Impressing a tiny it. expansion mm -hmm. of what they would see, right? So instead of seeing this, they're going to see this. No, 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 no. Because, because I said that to Mark Borshert and he said, no, no, it does not expand the visual field. Okay. The field is the same, but it's taking this that's here. It's constricting it and then it's, it's squishing it. And then uh -huh. it's shoving it into the field that they can see. So when the kid's looking straight ahead, yeah. what they're used to seeing is now gone. And now they're getting all of this smooshed together and shifted into the field they can see. Hmm. And my son kept going, just kept taking the glasses and throwing them off. Yeah. yeah. Cause he was used to seeing half of the world. And now he had to see all of this compressed kind of like, your side mirror on your car compresses the side so that you can see it. That's what it does. Yeah. yeah. I my also thought them. it yeah. expanded it. Yeah. You thought it expanded. Yeah. My son I wears did. them and, um, and he had an accidental trial where we got, he gets new glasses every year because he also has worsening acuity. And um, we got his new glasses and I said, these don't look like they have the prism in them. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, like, I'm like but they're not thick on one side. Like this is not, and he's like, oh no, 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 they're there. Let me, I, I took them back. They checked them. They're like, nope, they're in there. I'm like, wow, they must've really advanced the technology. So he starts wearing the glasses that, that don't have a prism that we don't know, walking into things, dropping things, knocking stuff off the table. And so we go back and we're like, the prisms are not in. And they were like, oh my God, you're right. Cause then we saw a different op optometrist and they fixed them and he was so relieved, but he's been wearing them since he was about eight. Um, and this happened when he was around 12. So by then he had really adapted to that way of seeing. So it's kind of the same thing. So like, there's definitely, it's like wearing progressives for the first time. There's an adjustment period, right? Yeah. Um, I want to honor everyone's time. I know it's 10 04. Um, we are, I'm happy to stay on. I don't know, Linda, what your time's like um, to answer a few more questions. And then Monica is going to finish um, her portion of the vision uh, presentation. And then this is going to be recorded. So you can all, anyone who needs to drop off can view it later. So let me just see if there were any other questions that we, there was someone who asked about going back to the visual neglect slide, but I think we have that. Would you share your slides with us, Linda, afterwards and I can upload them sure. with the recording? Okay. And, and then, then, by the way, that's sorry. That's, that's a compilation of my my Terry Schwartz, Gordon Dutton. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's an interesting question here that we didn't really get to that I would like to answer. Jill's still on here. My son's vision teacher concluded he does not need vision services in the assessment based on uh, learning media assessment because while he meets the criteria for visual impairment, he's not impacted educationally. My yeah. son does not read yet, and I posed the question about how issues with reading, et cetera, would be identified. Should we push to keep vision services on his IEP versus a consultative basis? So I think, Monica, if you want to do your portion of the presentation that covers the reading, yeah. um, I think once you see how they're impacted you'll that, that will answer the question for you and then maybe we can circle back to that do you want to do that 
Sure. I made you host again, so you should be able to present. Okay. But that's true. Having a visual, impal- visual, visual impairment alone is not enough to get services under the IDEA. You also have to have an educational impact. Uh, hold on a second. You would think after three years now. I cannot believe I still have people still have to say to me, "You're you're on mute. You're on mute." Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's continue with the visual field cut. So remember, I talked about your 100% acuity is uh, in the middle. I want you to look at this airplane and don't move your eyeballs from the airplane. Stay looking at the airplane and something is going to appear in your visual field. So don't don't look at it, but you're looking at the airplane. Can anyone kind of describe what just appeared in their visual field without moving their eyeballs from the airplane? Do we know what color it is? Something red on the road. (laughs) Something red on the road. Is it square? Is it round? Is it hollow? Kind of square to me. Kind of square. (laughs) And probably now look at it. So probably from context you gathered, it was probably a car. It's actually this fuchsia color. So remember when I, we go back in those slides, I talked about where color comes into play. It's, it's around here. Now something else is going to appear on the screen. Again, don't look at it. Keep your eyeballs on the airplane. Keep your eyeballs on the airplane. And can somebody describe what just came into your visual field? What color is it? Is it orange? Is it white? Is it purple? And can anyone tell me what it is? All right, everyone can look at it now. It's actually Nemo. Again, in your visual field, now you saw the movement. Remember again, I saw that out here in your peripheral vision is where you can start to see movement, but you really couldn't tell what color it was or what shape it was. You had to move your fovea, your central field of vision to the object in order to see what it is. Again, 100% acuity is where you need to put your eyeballs at in order to see text. So now we're gonna do some exercises around reading. On the next slide, I want you to focus only on the green word. Don't look away from the green word. I want you to try to read the entire paragraph without shifting your eyeballs from the green word. Let's try it. So there's the green word, the word is the. Can anyone read the entire paragraph without moving their eyeballs from the word the? Can you see the words around it without moving your eyeballs from it? Kind of, right? You can kind of see that there's the word nurse, that there's the word and underneath it. But as as we start to look to kind of shift our imagery away from the word the, you, you, you start to see that everything falls out of acuity. The only way you can read this paragraph is by taking your eyeballs and looking at each word, correct? Yes. That's because you have 100% acuity at the fixation point of your eyeballs. But as we move out from that fixation point, you start to lose acuity. That's why no one can read that entire paragraph without moving their eyeballs. Your paraphobial field is what you kind of see to the right, which gives you a hint at the text that's coming up so that your eyeballs know where to go next. But if you have a left hemispherectomy and now you have a right homonymous hemianopia, now you've lost half the word, you've also lost the paraphobial field, so you don't know where to move your eyes next. And in one of the papers that Dr. Lawrence cited around um, uh, by uh, an author named Shewitt, who talks about a hemianopic dyslexia, 
they talk about how people who could read before their occipital lobe strokes, if it's on the left side, now they're reading into nothingness and they hate reading. They don't want to read anymore because it's very difficult. So now we're asking our kids either to try to read again after having this hemianopia or learn how to read. And you can see how we're really starting to layer challenges on them, which is why it's critically important that the TVI who just said that your child doesn't need services in school, I bet he or she doesn't understand the impact of the hemianopia on learning how to read. Now let's do this again. Same exercise. Now you can't see half of the road if you're looking at that car. You're driving along and now something comes into your field of vision. You look over at the deer and now you you can't see the road ahead of you. I know everybody really wants their children to learn how to drive at some point, but look at how critically difficult it is to see the road when you have a homonymous hemianopia, left or right. Um, if you were on the other side of the road, then you would lose everything to the left. Um, this is why half the states in the union outright prohibit driving for somebody with a homonymous hemianopia. I personally have really strong feelings about this. I think it's very dangerous when you start to layer the other impairments our kids have, like the auditory processing where they can't localize sound, meaning can they localize where a siren's coming from? Their um, responses may be slow in terms of stepping on the brakes. They can't use one hand. They have a tough time with one foot. It seems outrageously dangerous to me on a personal level. I'm, I'm glad um, my son can't, can't drive for many reasons and this would be one of them. Now they're on the playground. They're looking at their friend's face. Their friend's kicking a ball over to them. If they have a right homonymous hemianopia, they can't see that that ball's coming at them. And this is why there may be misunderstandings on the playground, for example, because they, they can't see their friends running towards them or they can't see a ball coming to them. They're in a hallway, again, using right homonymous hemianopia as an example, they've lost half of the hallway. Unless they're trained to always look to the right, especially in crowded situations, then they're gonna run into people. And this is why I think so many of our kids, when they're in these crowded environments, they're really very challenged. It, they might have a behavioral outburst, which you think is a behavioral issue alone, but it's actually how they're reacting to the hemianopia. They're crossing the street, they see mom across the street, but they don't see that the bus is coming. If someone hasn't trained them to always look, on the right or to the left, wherever their visual field loss is. So again, even though they seem to be compensating really well, and you say that they only had a learning media assessment, they need a comprehensive visual assessment, orientation and mobility, looking at how their eyeballs move, working with a neuro-ophthalmologist who can tell the team when you put all these things together, how that visual impairment is affecting them in school. And these are some interventions, which I'll just keep up here, but I would like to move on to these accommodation strategies that we talked about, the head tilt, the face turn, all of these things can be compensatory. Um, some, uh, some, there's not consensus here as to whether the, Eye turning out is a compensatory mechanism, but when your eye turns out like that, you have two, two problems. One is you lose your binocular vision, and the second is you can develop an amblyopia over time. I know, Linda, you do recommend eye correction surgery, right, for the exotropia? Yeah, this it's 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 kind of interesting because there's very little in the literature about this, and yeah. uh, the initial paper had five cases, and you know, so it's it's really the evidence for the exotropia being compensatory. I think is soft. I think if yeah. you talk to ten different pediatric ophthalmologists, you probably get ten different answers, but some of it would be based on oh well someone said, yes. <laughs> instead of someone said, oh, oh, there were only three cases, but, and then everybody changes their whole practice based on that. So I, I think, again, it is absolutely 
every child needs to be assessed to try and decide if an eye muscle surgery is appropriate for them um, and not just go by three cases that in an yeah. article that was written years ago. Yeah. Uh, okay, continuing on, I'm moving fast because I know everybody has um, a time constraints. So now we're, we're asking them to learn how to read. We're telling them to look at the word alpine. They've got a right hemianopia. All they see is ALP. So unless the TBI is training the child where to look, how to gaze at the word, now you can see why so many of our kids may not learn how to read well because this is one of their major challenges. So the Schuett paper on homonymous uh, dis, uh, hemianopic di dyslexia talked about last letter cancellation therapy. The TBI could first tell the child, you know, put a red slash at the end of every letter. Let's go all the way to the end of the letter. So they start to learn to go to the end of the letter when they're reading. Reverse it if they've got a right, a left hemianopia after right hemispherectomy, then you're doing first letter cancellation therapy where you want them to always see the beginning of the word. Eccentric viewing is something that we've talked about. When you're looking at the word, typically we, you know, it's human nature to look at the middle, but if you have a right hemianopia, you've lost the right half of the word. If you tell the child to look towards the end of the word, now, most of the word is at the beginning of their visual field. The end of the word is at the, uh, the lost visual field. Again, shift this if your child has a left hemianopia. Putting a dot at the end of the word and then training the child to get the word into their visual field is one way that can be helpful. The, a lot of the CBI Literature, the CBI, the, the Lansky Cortical Vision Impairment book talks about making text bigger. We're not sure that that works in our kids. The Schuett paper on hemianopic dys dyslexia talked about really the words kind of need to be smaller so that more of the word is in their visual field. We don't know what smaller means and we don't know exactly what bigger means. Follow your child's lead. Um, use common sense when you're looking at the size of the letters, when they're starting to read words, you know, ask them if they're, if they're verbal, can you see most of the word? Is it helpful if I make it bigger or is it helpful if I make it smaller? With my son, we're constantly in a battle with the TBI because she keeps saying he should only have four images on his device and the words have to be in text that's 30. And I'm like, no, actually, Look, when I write hamburger this small, he can see it and he pushes that word just fine. I know the size of the letters that my son can see. So I have to advocate really strongly for that in school. Vertical presentation of text is another great way of learning when they're learning how to read rather than having it in a sentence, when they're learning words to present everything vertically. Um, putting a, just a, a yellow marker on the side of the paragraph so that they know where the paragraph ends if they have a right hemianopia, and again, for a left hemianopia, uh, doing it on the left. And I'll stop, uh, oh no, this is the readalyzer that Audrey was talking about. So this is how you and I read. Good readers will, their eyes make a series of small jerky movements and linger on each word for a quarter of a second. And by measuring these pauses, you can uh, tell how you read and how long it takes you to recognize a word. And this is actually Audrey's son reading. So he has a left hemianopia. He's applying for college. Look, look at how much he's re-reading the words he just read. He's not hopping forward fluidly he keeps going back to reread. So even in a child who is reading, is going to go off to college, he's struggling with getting his eyeballs on the words in a smooth way. And your children probably are too. This is another thing the TBI needs to be aware of when they're testing for fluency, especially that slow reader may be slow because they're having trouble getting their eyeballs on the words in the first place because of how the motor strip has affected how we shift our eyeballs after surgery. And so these are all the common 
challenges that can come with a hemianopic dyslexia and um, some of the interventions that you can use um, like correcting maladaptations. What we see a lot of the kids doing is they guess a word because they can't see it. You want to stop them from doing that. The instructor needs to make sure that they're actually reading the word. Uh, maybe they only see the beginning of the word so they guess the rest of the word. You don't want them to maladapt that way. These are all things that, that the TVI can do there. Uh, I search training, this is free. Um, it's to help your child um, compensate for that, the spatial neglect and the hemianopia learning to look at the whole page. It's something that they can do for free online. And that's it. That's the rest of my hemianopia presentation. I just wanna make sure that I could sneak it in here so you can come back and watch it. All right, we have a few people still with us. Does anyone have any final questions before we say thank you to our amazing presenters? I have, I have one, one, I wanted to make one more comment about vision therapy because, you know, back to whoever was telling about the occupational therapist that had been trained, you know, there's a difference, like I say, the definition of visual therapy for an ophthalmologist is someone who does eye exercises, not someone who's doing vision rehabilitation and looking at the whole child. So we have another professional called orthoptists who do some of that and things like, I mean, there's things that are done in a therapeutic manner by across the disciplines that maybe people call vision therapy, but it's not what we as ophthalmologists think of as vision therapy. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to find, you know, if you have OTs who are on board, teachers, and there may be vision therapy, you know, optometric um, interventions too. So you, you just, unfortunately, you've got to seek out those people and be sure you understand what the outcomes are is what I'm saying, that it's not just, oh, we're going to exercise your eyeballs, but we're actually going to do rehabilitation for the whole child in a manner that's appropriate and unique for that child. So we call it vision rehabilitation, not vision therapy though. <laughs> I noticed recently, actually, so UC Berkeley um, here in, in California has a low vision clinic. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the larger university centers in different states have them, not everyone, but they have a, they, they have a, what they call a binocular vision clinic and they do vision therapy, but they don't call it vision therapy either. I can't remember what they call it, but that is all covered by insurance and Medi-Cal. So I, when I have families asking me, I'm like, go there because you'll get it's covered and they figured out how to get insurance to pay for it because they're not calling it vision therapy. So that it's, the terminology does matter. Um, and, and the same thing with the school district, like how, what you call something can determine whether or not you get it. Because right. <laughs> if you go into the yeah. school and say, I want vision therapy for my child, the answer is gonna be no. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so, all right. Um, I'm going to send an evaluation. I'm going to send a lot of resources about vision. That's going to be quite a long list. I apologize. And uh, the recording of today's presentation. And hopefully um, Dr. Lawrence can share her slides and um, I'll add Monica's slides as well. Thank you all. I really appreciate this. And I'm, we're getting lots of thank you. Thank you. This was great. Thank you as always. It was amazing. Incredibly helpful. Thanks so much. So Linda, I really appreciate you being here and Monica, of course. Yeah, and Dr. Lawrence, thank you so much for all you do for us. I appreciate being here. I, I, I have a lot to learn too. So I really appreciate being at these meetings and especially hearing from parents what their questions are because that helps me in my own practice think about what might be important for my families that I may not be thinking of. So thanks, thanks to all of you families. <laughs> You always say yes every time I ask. You have to say no every once in a while, but you never, you never have. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. -bye.